Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. Uh, question time, COVID-19 vaccination, um, focusing in on the BAME communities. Um, as you join, please look at the Twitter hashtags. If you'd like to tweet that you're with us this afternoon, that would be great. Um, my name is Amjid Ali and I'm the BAME Engagement and Inclusion Lead for Kidney Care UK. Um, it's a real privilege to be a part of the charity and to be able to uh, work on this product, project with uh, our colleagues from um, the BAME community. So without further ado, um, if we could go to the first slide, please, Julie. Okay, and uh, next slide. So just a little housekeeping before I make the introductions. Um, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's panel experts by typing your questions into the question and answer pane of the control panel at the bottom of the screen. Um, you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and our panel experts and the team will endeavor to answer as many of these during the webinar. Um, we also have a session within the webinar that is dedicated to additional Q&A, which will be facilitated by my colleagues, Della Adewu and Primrose Granville. Um, the other aspects that I'd like to cover off in, in this session are that um, questions can be upvoted by clicking the thumbs up next to the question. Um, please post any technical issues to the chat box and we will try to resolve them promptly. And I would respectfully request that please do not use the chat box to post questions, but stick to the Q&A box only. Um, as you will see, the red light in the corner the meeting is being recorded and will be available on YouTube with subtitles um, shortly after um, this webinar is concluded. Um, as we said, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions uh, to today's panel as we go through. And it's really important that um, we enable you to do that and we facilitate that. Um, we've got a great team of panel experts with us, which I'm going to introduce to you briefly now. So if Julie, if we may go to the next slide. Now, we're delighted to have with us today, supporting the webinar, a diverse group of clinicians with expertise in virology, immunology, renal, respiratory, and general medicine. Um, as part of this conversation, we also felt it was important to include faith leaders. And again, we have a range of speakers who will share their personal lived experiences of supporting BAME communities since the advent of COVID-19. We also have to support the Q&A session, um, a number of community representatives with an interest in renal and a specialist nurse who is also working with patients on a daily basis. Now in going back to the, the actual format and agenda of today, the webinar is being split into three sections. Um, we will begin following the formal introduction by our guest speaker with a clinical overview Part two will then be the Q&A session, which will be chaired, as I said, by my colleagues Della and Primrose. And then moving on from that, we will hear from our uh, uh, faith leaders who kindly agreed to give up their time to be with us this evening. And, and that would session will be chaired by my colleague, Oren Lewis. Now, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to pass on to my colleague, Oren, um, who will introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar. Thank you, Julian, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you for that, um, Amjad, and congratulations to you and uh, Kidney Care UK to, uh, for putting on this great event uh, to enlighten us all. Um, it's an honor and pleasure to, to welcome our guest moderator speaker. The limited time that we've, we've actually got with her before she reads the, the, the news later on, as you can see, she's in the studio. And without further ado, I just want to welcome to this webinar um, the host of ITV's Loose Women and the main presenter of the ITV local and national news, Ms. Charlene White. Thank you so much. And, um, a huge thank you um, to all of you on the team who've invited me along today. I'm, I apologise. I'd love to be able to stay for um, the entire seminar, but unfortunately I'm not able to because as Oren said, I am on the telly in about 45 minutes. But this is such an important thing to be involved in um, because I feel 
in the bottom of my heart that it is very, very important that we get the message across to everybody within our communities, how important it is to take up that offer of a COVID vaccine. Now, the reasons behind a lot of the reluctance is almost understandable due to when it comes to things like racism within healthcare and generally um, uh, the impact on the disparities and the inequalities that exist, unfortunately, uh, within this country. However, your health is hugely important. And I know that myself, my cousins and my brother and my sister have had a lot of issues over the last few months in terms of trying to convince our own family members to take up that offer of, of the vaccine because we see it as being hugely important and we just want the, the elder members of our family to be safe and, and not feel as though we will be putting them at risk should we go to their house and hang out at my aunt's for dinner um, and she not have the jab. So that's why I'm a part of this today because I think as we need to be selling that message loud and proud and explain to people our health is hugely important and especially within our older communities those of us who are younger do want you around for a lot longer and we do care about your health and we see that as being hugely important and none of us wants to be in the situation that we're in right now all of us want to be able to hug our family members again and at least pop around to the house for dinner so the sooner we can get out of this with our health and with our lives because i've lost family members to this so the more of us that can leave this pandemic with our lives intact so we no longer have to go through that grieving process over and over again when it comes to losing loved ones to COVID, then that's the main thing to be perfectly honest. So that's why we're doing this seminar and that's why this session is happening. Now we do hope to answer as many questions that you may well have and any concerns that you have. And you know, as Amjir said, we have got so many experts who will be coming up shortly to talk you through certain aspects of the, of the vaccine and to talk about worries that people have spoken about and also answer your questions. So things like, is it best for me? Um, uh, what should I be doing to keep myself safe after I've had the vaccine? Do you still need to be following restrictions, for example? Um, we're talking about those first and second doses because I know that people get a bit concerned about just how much um, they are protective of, protected after that first dose. And also new variants, because I know it's been popular, talk, popular in the last couple of weeks the South African variant and what's been highlighted in the last few days is is whether or not some of these vaccines can even protect you from that South African variant so that's really important questions which I know that that will be answered if you're pregnant for example uh, is it safe for you to have it I've got friends who are pregnant who've been asking that very same question and about those side effects side effects and about the efficacy and things like should you be able to choose which one of the vaccinations you take or should you be waiting for one one that perhaps protects you against a new variant later on down the line. All these questions um, will be answered. And this is part of a series of, uh, of webinars on COVID-19 and kidney patients um, with Kidney Care UK, the Renal Association and the British Renal Society, supported by a Gift of Life donation and the African Caribbean Leukemia Trust, who I've worked alongside and with for a number of years. I'm hugely passionate about the work that they do. This is a free webinar and um, as, as has been highlighted before, it is going to be, it is currently being recorded. And so you'll be able to send the link to your friends and members of your family who may well still be sitting on the fence where taking the vaccination is concerned. So perhaps if you're able to send the link to this, it could help allay some of their fears um, too. Um, so we've got a panel of, uh, of regional medical professionals and faith leaders, I'm really pleased that we've got faith leaders involved in this, um, who are gonna share their knowledge and also answer questions about the coronavirus vaccine and chronic uh, kidney disease. So I know that Amjad sort of ran, showed you on the screen who's gonna be talking, but I'm just gonna say their names uh, because um, they, they deserve to be picked up at the start of this because they are giving their time um, to you guys to sort of talk you through this because I cannot, I cannot, you know, overestimate or underestimate um, how passionate we are all about this because, you know, we all want to get out of this. And we talk about on the news a lot about fake news 
and there is a lot of fake news and there's a lot of untruths that are being shared on platforms such as WhatsApp, for example. And it makes our job a lot harder because we don't always, um, au fait, we don't get a lot of those WhatsApp mess messages that are forwarded, especially to the older community. Um, so we are sort of trying, not trying to play catch up, but we are trying to get ahead of all of those wrong messages because those wrong messages could end up causing more people to lose their lives and that is not what we want so what we will have is um what is COVID-19 which is presented by Dr Javid Ahmed and we have uh, a session two sessions in fact uh, by Dr Phil Bright a consultant clinical immunologist uh, they'll be talking about what are vaccines, um, giving a vaccine case study, and also talk about vaccine development, which is important because a lot of people are worried about things like new variants. And I think we do all need to get a really clear understanding about exactly how this works when new variants are concerned. We'll also be talking about vaccine trials, um, which is one of the reasons why some of my family members uh, were initially reluctant to take up uh, the COVID vaccine because they felt as though those trials had happened far too quickly. There is a reason why, and that has a lot to do with the fact this is a global issue. Um, but Dr. Phil Bright will be getting into more detail about that. Dr. Adnan Sharif, we're talking about COVID-19 and kidney patients. Um, Dr. Huzaifa, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. And uh, they'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on BAME communities. Dr. Valentine, we're talking about also talking about the impact on those communities. And uh, Dr. Javid Ahmed will be specifically looking at COVID-19 vaccines. The reality of all of this and why we are getting involved in this is especially the black community are four times more likely to lose their life, to die as a result of COVID-19. And yet, Half of those, so when we look about, uh, when we look at the, the white community and in terms of the take up there, we're only looking at half those numbers when it comes to the black community. Only half of those who have currently, who've been offered the vaccine so far, have taken up the offer of that, but we are four times more likely to die from this. Those numbers are completely unacceptable. And those issues surrounding it are ones that do need to be talked about. They are issues that do need to be discussed and they are issues that do need to be sorted. But at this particular moment in time, saving lives is the most important element of this story. We do not want to lose more lives. I know I don't want to lose more family members. And for any of those who are on this seminar who have also lost family members, I'm sure none of you want to lose any more family or any more friends. This will be a really informative seminar for all of you. And I do apologize that I can't be here for much longer, but I do have to be in the studio in about 10 minutes. But I really, really hope that you get all of the information that you need today. I do really hope that it does allay some of your fears. And I hope that for any of you who have ignored that call or ignored that information or that in invitation to go for your vaccine. I hope that after this seminar, you contact the your GP or contact the, 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 the uh, medical sector within your, um, within your area who has invited you for that appointment. I hope that you do give them a call tomorrow, pop them an email, leave a message on a voicemail and set up that appointment once again. Um, and I hope that none of you have to lose your lives as a result of this. So thank you so much to the team for inviting me along to this. And guys, enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Charlene. That is uh, it's excellent um, landscape you've, you've, you've laid out for this, the rest of the seminar, this webinar, for us to discuss and to scrutinize and to debate. And uh, just really want to say thank you on behalf of the whole team here uh, for giving us your, your, your precious time to uh, do this on, on, on behalf of everyone, especially those from the Reno community. I'd like to hand back to my uh, main speaker, uh, Mr. Amjad Ali, to start the main agenda with the uh, physicians doing their presentation. Amjad? Thank you, Oren. Um, may I just begin by saying I'd like to echo your words uh, of thanks to uh, our guest speaker, Charlene. Thank you so much. Charlene, it means a lot to us all um, for you giving up your time to be with us this afternoon. So thank you again from me. Um, okay, let's move on um, to our speakers. And we're going to begin um, with Dr. Javid Ahmed, um, who is a consultant virologist 
Um, I would ask him to introduce himself briefly before he um, starts his presentation. Um, and so over to you, Dr. Javi. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Amjad, uh, my co-panelist, uh, Kidney Care UK, and the wider audience uh, who have dialed in today. And uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me the time to speak on this format. Uh, I have to say it is an honor and privilege to speak to you all. Uh, and uh, it's an excellent work you all are doing. Um, okay, uh, I am Javed Ahmed. I'm a consultant virologist. Uh, um, I, I spent a, a, a significant part of my time in Southeast London at King's and Guy's and St. Thomas's. I, I was working as a consultant virologist for Public Health England at Bristol before I moved to my main base here at um, Mid-Essex, which is South End. I also am an honorary consultant virologist at King's College Hospital. So uh, let me crack on with the, uh, with the short time with the, with the what is COVID-19. So COVID-19, uh, you may know, is an illness. It's called by novel coronavirus. When we say novel, it means it has never circulated in the past. It's been recorded first time in the human history. That's what we meant in novel. It's caused by a virus, what we call as SARS-CoV-2, simply an abbreviation of a severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus 2. Um, the reason why it is called coronavirus 2 is because we had an, uh, another similar coronavirus way back in 2003, which was quickly eradicated, eliminated within 18 months in 2003 and 2004. So this virus was identified, uh, like you may know, in the end of 2019 in the Wuhan province in China, and uh, cases actually very quickly spread. Uh, like fire, like rapid fire, okay? and uh, in a matter of few weeks, jumped the countries, crossed continents, and uh, led to the WHO declaring it as a pandemic uh, in March 2020. So it does appear to be a very highly contagious uh, a, a virus. Simply, for, as a matter of fact, that there are the, it's, because it's a novel virus, there is no immunity among uh, the human population. So give, just to give a background, because there are a lot of uh, fears among, uh, among the wider public, uh, coronavirus are not new. Neither are the scientists who are studying coronavirus are not new. Uh, I know uh, scientists who have spent a lifetime uh, you know, on coronaviruses. And, uh, they, uh, and uh, there are at least uh, seven coronaviruses which infect uh, human beings, us. And um, possibly, I think, uh, or, or, or many of the experts think, uh, that they have been with us for a millennia or so. Um, uh, and, uh, and we have to say some of those coronaviruses, which we call them today as mild, possibly might have caused major epidemics and pandemics when they became novel, uh, when, they were, uh, when they caused, now they have slowly melted into the population as causing a common cause of common cold. Uh, and uh, coronavirus is very common in the animal world, particularly bats uh, and uh, certain, uh, I mean, uh, and many mammals. And, uh, and uh, this might have originated very likely with what we know of the virus, very likely from a jump from the animals to humans uh, in, 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 China, in, in the Chinese province. So very quickly, it has adapted to uh, spread among human beings. Uh, and in the past 20 years, this is the third time coronavirus have jumped from uh, animals to the human world. Uh, the first one, which I just said, was the SARS-CoV in 2003. Uh, and, and we were lucky at that time, simply because the people who were infected with SARS-CoV in 2003, they were transmitting the infection only when they were symptomatic. Unfortunately, it's not a case with this uh, SARS-CoV-2 which causes COVID-19 because we know the majority of the population can be asymptomatic and even asymptomatics can spread the infection. And even individuals, those who go on to develop symptoms may have a period where they might uh, transmit the infection prior to development of symptoms. This, has actually, this is actually a major driving factor why it became a, so quickly a pandemic. The other coronavirus which has jumped uh, from, uh, from the animals to human beings is the MERS-CoV. I want to highlight something about MERS-CoV here simply because uh, there's a lot of concern that how come we know so much about uh, the coronavirus, particularly with the development of the vaccines. A lot of work and research has gone into coronavirus in, part, in the past 40 years, particularly with the MERS-CoV. When the MERS-CoV came in 20, 
12, 2013, it caused uh, a major mortality, particularly in the Middle East, major hospital infection control. Um, and uh, But uh, in a matter of six to seven years, um, it, it's largely restricted to a geographical area. Now, it led to many scientists, for the, the people who have designed this COVID vaccine, it led to ma many scientists to see what is the reason why MERS-CoV is causing the infection. And they also studied the original SARS-CoV and they found that, that is a, there is a particular protein, yeah, something like what is there on the envelope, uh, what we call as a key, which we call as a spike, which attaches to the human cell. So they studied it closely, but unfortunately because MERS-CoV became a, 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 not much of interest that was uh, thrown into the back burn, uh, we almost had a vaccine for MERS-CoV. So when this uh, virus was identified uh, and quickly we came to know what exactly this is. Now for wider audience, uh, a virus is, is cannot replicate on its own. It depends on the host cell. Uh, and uh, the, the purpose, if I had to say the virus, is to go and infect the host cell and turn the host cell into a factory in producing its babies what we call this in our language, replication. And it does it very, very effectively, every virus. And SARS-CoV-2 is not an exception. It, 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 multi, it replicates in millions and trillions of copies, even in a single host every day. Now, SARS-CoV is an RNA virus because our viruses can either have one type of nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA. Now, the problem with the RNA viruses is when they replicate, there's something what we call has, um, they, they go through a kind of a factor mechanism. you kind of re reading the code, is this correct, is this correct? Now, RNA virus in their nature, they lack that proof reading capacity, which means every time it replicates, there might be possibly an, an error. Some errors, or majority of the errors will die off, they, but some of the errors can survive. And uh, these errors, which you might have heard in the popular press, what we call as mutants or variants. So um, uh, SARS-CoV, because being by the nature is an RNA virus, it is uh, prone to, it has got a propensity to develop a, a huge number of variants. And you mind you infecting um, uh, millions of people worldwide, and then even a single host having millions of replication cycles, you can imagine the number of mutants, it, can be, it, it might potentially arise. So, the, sorry. Am I okay? Sorry, uh, um, and uh, and then uh, just to let you know about the virus itself, uh, because we need to know the virus just to see um, educate ourselves for the vaccine. The virus, the brain of the virus is the RNA, which is covered by its helmet, which protects the RNA, which is called the capsid, and uh, the the virus is like a thief. It it if it, when it attacks a house, it it has to have the keys. So the envelope, you know, the thief covering when it sneaks in, it, it goes, that's the envelope and the envelope has got plenty of keys and the keys match the lock. So the, the keys is the spike, what we call it, and you might have heard, um, this is the spike and the human uh, uh, respiratory cells have got that lock. So uh, the, the reason why I said that is because the vaccines which you have developed are designed to prevent those keys working. So, they, so which, which means they are, all the vaccines which are currently listed as of now in our country are designed for, to, to, to create antibodies against the spike, which is the key, which, which is the key mechanism. So um, um, what happens once the infection is established after a massive amount of replication, the virus comes, infects other cells, then it managed to infect, uh, I mean, once it's, uh, somebody coughs or sneezes, or to, then it can infect uh, any uh, the other susceptible uh, individuals. There. And um, just to wind off what, exa what exactly in, 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 um, in the, the, the COVID-19, the disease arises in a, what we call as an incubation period from the exposure to somebody developing the, the disease. We think it's between two to 14 days, but from our experience, majority of the cases uh, are five days. Now, uh, I, I want to highlight that simply because a lot of people come and say, oh, I had a vaccine and it still got a disease. That's because the vaccine works typically two weeks after vaccination, but the majority of the COVID-19 cases, uh, they, they, they become symptomatic five days on an average after being exposed. So the, the individuals that are not exposed uh, uh, and they might have developed the disease earlier before antibody kicks in from the vaccine. So it's, it's not that the vaccines are not working there. So um, there, are, there are a lot of things. And then uh, you, you might have heard what happens with the COVID-19. I think my respiratory colleagues will highlight that or, what, or how the human individual uh, faces that disease. 
Um, Thank so, you, Dr. Javid. I think you, um, you kindly segued us into the next part of the presentation. That was really, really comprehensive in terms of uh, explaining it for the layman's to, uh, person like me. You've gone through the whole kind of history of, of COVID-19 in a way that I'm, I'm hoping that will have helped all of our participants uh, uh, develop a broader understanding of the topic. And I'm sure there will be questions on the, the chat as we progress through um, that our colleagues will be able to answer. But uh, as I was saying, that neat, uh, segues us in neatly into the, the next part of um, the seminar. Um, and, and I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our, our colleague, Dr. Phil Bright. Uh, Dr. Phil Bright is from North Bristol Trust, and I'm hoping he will do a brief introduction of himself before um, he talks um, about uh, COVID-19 vaccines and their development. So over to you, Dr. Phil. Uh, thank you very much, Amjid, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, all, all the people involved um, in, in setting up this, 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 this seminar or, or webinar. Um, right, um, I'm a doctor, a physician. Um, I'm based at uh, North Bristol Trust in, in, uh, in Bristol. Uh, I am a, a clinician. I look after people with immune deficiency, uh, HIV and allergies. And the reason I'm, I've been, become involved in this is that I've uh, been involved in some of the vaccine studies, uh, the Oxford vaccine study and uh, a new vaccine study from Janssen. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the studies and some, some things about vaccines. Uh, so the first question I'm, I'm, I'm gonna address is uh, what are vaccines? Uh, so uh, vaccines are substances created to cause an immune response to provide protection against a particular infection. Uh, they're made by taking a part of the whole of a bug which cause an infection such as COVID or meningitis or polio or another infection and altering this bug or part of the bug so that it doesn't actually cause an infection but does trigger the immune response and from that you get protection from the disease in future. So for COVID this involves utilising a part of the COVID uh, uh, virus called the spike protein and uh, Dr Ahmed's already mentioned that. Uh, it's only a small part of the COVID uh, virus. Uh, this spike protein is produced in different ways with the different vaccines, but the end result is an immune response to this bit of the bug. Um, I'm going to talk a, about a few case studies now, so, so uh, of vaccines, different vaccines that have been useful in the past. And I, I think the biggest success story for vaccination is a disease called smallpox, which was removed from the planet by vaccination in 1980. Uh, the eradication of this disease is estimated to save 5 million lives a year, which is a person not dying of smallpox every six seconds, which is just a fantastic result. Um, I'm going to talk about two other examples of the success of vaccination, which are polio and meningitis. And uh, I, uh, could somebody put up the first slide, please, which is the one about polio. Um, apologies for the complexity of this, of this slide. I'll talk you through it. Um, so to, to begin with, polio is an infection uh, which can cause paralysis. Uh, it was very common in, in, in days gone by. Um, and it's been eradicated from the world apart from small areas in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And here, here on this graph, uh, you can see uh, what happened in the UK with the introduction of the vaccines. So you can see on, on the, the axis on the side going up, this is the number of cases, and it's about 7,000 in about 1945. And then along the bottom of the years, uh, after the introduction of two vaccines, and you can see that the numbers of cases goes all the way down to pretty much zero, and that's happened throughout much of the world. And that is uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of these vaccines. And I'd also like to mention meningitis, which is uh, something that is, is, is an ongoing issue, unlike polio in the UK. Um, and uh, meningitis is a severe infectious disease that primarily affects children and young people presents with headache, rash and fever, amongst other symptoms, and kills between 5 and 10% of individuals who have it in the UK. There are different bugs that cause the, the, this disease, but a bug called meningococcus uh, is a major cause. There are different types of meningococcus, and the lines on this graph are for the different types. Uh, they're defined by letters. Um, and a meningitis vaccination uh, against meningococcal type C, so a particular type of the bug, was introduced in 1999. And the important line here, so I'll explain the graph again, it's similar to the past one, with the number of cases up, up the side and then the years going by along the bottom. Um, the, uh, the graph that looks like a downward hill uh, that starts at about 1,000 and goes down, it starts at about 1,000 in 99, and with vaccination you can see that it drops to almost zero showing just how well this vaccine works. 
Uh, vaccinations do have side effects, but these, va these vaccines and, and all the vaccinations available are safe and extremely effective in, in reducing infectious disease. And it's estimated that current vaccines are saving five lives a minute, you know, which is a fantastic uh, thing for vaccination to be done. Um, and, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about vaccine development. Um, could, could we remove the slides uh, for, uh, for now and then I'll come back to the ingredients a bit later. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there's understandable concern from many individuals that the COVID vaccines have been developed too quickly. Now uh, I do understand that but in my view this is really a cause for celebration rather than concern and demonstrates how far science has come in vaccine development. I can assure you that the processes uh, and the procedures for vaccine development have been followed and that the vaccines would not have been approved by the independent national bodies had they not uh, uh, gone through all the necessary processes. And there are particular factors that have contributed to the speed at which uh, these COVID vaccines have been created and approved for COVID, which are firstly practically unlimited funding for these studies. Uh, collaborative working between doctors, drug companies, governments and regulatory authorities, and I've been very much involved in that. Um, the, the, uh, the fact that there were already, as part of the plan response to the pand pandemics like COVID, ways of quickly making vaccines using methods that were already proven in other infections. Uh, the fact that lots of people were willing to sign up to trials, that meant we could do the trials quickly, lots of people, and there was lots of COVID infection around, meaning that we could demonstrate a difference in infection between vaccinated and un unvaccinated groups quickly. All of these things have led to the speed uh, with which the, the, those COVID vaccines have been demonstrated to work and then approved. Um, I'm going to talk about two vaccines, uh, the, the two vaccines that are commonly available in the UK currently, uh, and about how they were developed, uh, which are the Pfizer and the Oxford vaccines. Uh, these were each made differently. Um, firstly, the Pfizer vaccine was created by putting a small bit of the COVID virus's RNA uh, in a small package. Uh, th this is completely new technology. Um, the RNA, as uh, Dr. Ahmed mentioned, is the code the viruses use for how to make itself and reproduce. Uh, the RNA in this vaccine has only a very small amount of the virus's RNA in order to make a small bit of the virus called the spike protein. It cannot cause COVID infection and also cannot alter our DNA and only lasts in our body for a very short period of time. Uh, the small bit of the COVID virus created from this viral RNA then produces an immune response and that's how we get the protection. Um, could we go on to the next slide please, which is about the ingredients in the Pfizer vaccine. Yeah, so, so uh, not terribly interesting uh, in terms of a list of things, but that there is the mRNA of the virus. There are lipids which are involved in making the package which you put the mRNA in. And then there are some things to stabilize the, uh, the, the vaccine. But these are all the ingredients that are in the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pretty simple, uh, it, there's complexity in making it, but there aren't that many ingredients. Um, the Oxford vaccine was made slightly differently. It was produced by putting the little bit of the COVID virus RNA, similar to the Pfizer vaccine, into a virus that causes the common cold, not in humans actually in this particular case, but in chimpanzees. Uh, some of the other cold viruses for some of the other viruses are human uh, common cold viruses. And in this particular case, the cold virus has been altered to mean it can't reproduce itself. It can't make more. It is able to produce a little bit of the COVID virus uh, uh, protein we want to provoke an immune response. Um, the ingredients of this are listed on uh, the next slide, please. Um, so there is the weakened genetically modified chimpanzee cold virus with the COVID RNA in it. There are a whole bunch of things that you have to be a chemist to fully understand, but I do note that alcohol, a very small amount uh, is, is involved, which I think will be uh, of important, it may, I think it will be addressed uh, later on in this uh, webinar, uh, particularly for those of the Muslim faith. And talking about whether or not these vaccines are live or non-live, the Pfizer vaccine is a non-live vaccine, and technically the Oxford vaccine is a live vaccine, but it can't replicate, meaning uh, it can't cause infection, and none of, none of the, the, uh, the vaccines that are available uh, are able to cause infections. Thank you. Uh, could you put me back on screen, please? 
So uh, next I'm going to talk about COVID vaccine trials. So these are things that I have been involved in with the Oxford and Janssen studies. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to focus on the Pfizer and Oxford vaccine trials as the ones that, that are most pertinent to the vaccines that people are receiving at the moment. Uh, th these trials are performed in very similar manners and essentially look at whether or not the COVID vaccine is effective in preventing COVID disease and what the side effects are. So firstly, for the Pfizer vaccine, the Pfizer study recruited about 40,000 individuals, mostly from the US, but also South America, South Africa and Europe. Individuals received two doses of uh, 21 days apart of either the Pfizer vaccine or a salty water solution called a placebo in a 50-50 ratio decided by chance for each individual, just like a coin toss. As I mentioned, they were looking for COVID disease. Uh, and that's important because they weren't looking for asymptomatic disease. It was people that actually had symptoms. Uh, and in order to get diagnosed on the study, the individuals involved had to get symptoms and then have a positive uh, swab for COVID. Uh, the study then compared the numbers of cases of COVID with symptoms between the people who'd received the COVID vaccination and the placebo. And it was to everyone's surprise just how effective the vaccine was. And it prevented 19 in 20 cases of COVID with symptoms in individuals who were vaccinated. A fantastic result, far more than what anyone expected. And there were no serious safety concerns. Um, you could not be a part of this study if you had a condition which affected your immune system, but you could if you had a stable medical condition, which could have included renal impairment, but they weren't specifically recruited and that's not stated in the publications about it. So now to talk about the Oxford vaccine study. Well, the process of that study was very similar. It recruited just under 24,000 individuals from the UK, Brazil and South Africa. And they published the results of a subset of these. The important difference was that instead of using salty water, they used a meningitis vaccine as the alternative to the COVID vaccine. Uh, participants received two doses of either the meningitis vaccine or the COVID vaccine. And they looked again for COVID with symptoms confirmed on, on a swab. And uh, the Oxford vaccine prevented 14 in 20 cases of COVID, so not quite as many, um, uh, 14 in 20 cases of COVID with symptoms um, in the individuals who received the COVID vaccine. But importantly, there were no admissions to hospital or deaths in those who received the COVID vaccine and 10 admissions and one death in those who received the meningitis vaccine. So it is having a really significant effect. And there were no serious safety concerns in that study either. Uh, this study also excluded those with conditions that affect the immune system, but included participants with comorbidities, which could have included renal failure, but it's not stated on the publication. So uh, in summary, well, so vaccines do stimulate your immune system, so side effects are expected. However, these are generally very mild and include a sore arm, headache, fever, that sort of thing, and feeling a bit tired for a day or two. But what these side effects really show is that the vaccine is working and that your immune system is doing something. Uh, severe side effects such as allergic reactions are extremely rare. Um, additionally, hot off the press, uh, you may have heard in the last week or so that there is preliminary data from the Oxford vaccine um, that it is capable of reducing transmission of COVID uh, by around two thirds. This means that getting vaccinated is effective in reducing the chance you will infect those around you as well as being effective in preventing disease in you, the one that's been vaccinated. Um, in terms of COVID vaccines in the Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, well, firstly, I'd say that the similarities between different ethnicities in immune responses is much greater than any differences between them. Therefore, you can use data from non-BAME groups and apply this to BAME groups reasonably. Um, and it is true that recruitment of participants from BAME groups in the studies was relatively low, but not that low. The recruitment of uh, black or Asian individuals in the Pfizer vaccine trial was 13.6%, which equated to just over 5,000 people. And for the Oxford trial, uh, the recruitment of black, Asian or ethnically mixed individuals was about 16.5%, which equates to just under 2,000 individuals. So that adds up, adds up to about 7,000 individuals in these studies uh, who were BAME. And additional to this, I did a calculation earlier today and worked out that over half a million BAME individuals in the UK will now have received a COVID vaccine without any significant safety concerns being raised from that. So I would say to those from BAME groups that these vaccines are for you, for your family and for your communities to prevent COVID in, the, in you and those around you. Now I'm just going to try and answer some common questions about vaccines and these may be brought up in the Q&A as well. 
So firstly, I'd like to answer which vaccine is best for me or for you? The answer to this question for those with renal disease, household members of those with renal disease and members of the BAME community is whichever one is offered to you first, because that will give you the protection as soon as possible. And it's not clear that any one vaccine is better than the others. I mean, the overriding thing is we're surprised they all work really well in general. Um, I'd also like to address the question of why is the gap between vaccinations different? This has raised a concern in lots of people that the, the gap between vaccinations is, is different in our national vaccination program to that used in the trials. This decision was made on two grounds. Firstly, to give some immunity to as many people as, as quickly as possible, which was really important uh, in the situation of the new variant, the Kent variant that came out, which was more infective. And secondly, because it was felt that based on the evidence that delaying the second dose would not significantly reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine, how well it worked, and might actually improve it. And this decision has recently been found to be the right one with proven good protection from the Oxford vaccine up to three months following just one dose. And it's thought the same principles will apply to other vaccines and there's some evidence to back this up. Um, Funny that, um, as mentioned by Charlene, uh, that there is this question about the new variants and whether the vaccines are effective. Now, this is a really rapidly evolving situation that is really difficult to keep up with and worrisome to, uh, to everybody. Now, and the answer is that, that vaccines are likely to have some effect. Now, the Oxford and Pfizer vaccines are effective against the currently circulating variants in the UK. Although there was a particular concern about whether or not they'll be effective against the South Africa variant. And some new data from last week showed that, that, that in a young population and a small group in, in South Africa, that the Oxford vaccine didn't work very well in that situation. And this means that it's likely that further vac vaccinations will be needed in future with slightly altered vaccines. And work on this is already underway. This is a concern, uh, but I, I would say that the vaccines we have will have some effect in, pre in preventing uh, disease in the individuals and may also have an effect on transmission. Um, I've got two more questions I'd like to answer during the talk, which are, firstly, is it safe to receive the vaccine in pregnancy or when breastfeeding? And the, 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 the UK advice on this at the moment is that it's not recommended in general to receive the COVID vaccine in pregnancy, unless you're considered at particularly high risk of getting COVID or getting severe disease if you did get COVID. Um, and that's something that if you're concerned about, you should uh, talk to your doctors about. Uh, you can receive the vaccine if you're breastfeeding, and it's also recommended that you can receive the vaccine if you're intending on, on getting pregnant. And finally, I'd like to address a question about whether or not COVID vaccine can make you infertile. Now, th this idea came from a, a blog from an epidemiologist in Germany who suggested the COVID vaccine might create antibodies to a protein on eggs or sperm. But there's no evidence to support that COVID vaccines cause infertility in men or women. And uh, women who have received the vaccine have got pregnant. Uh, so that's, that's everything I wanted to say today. I look forward to your questions. And I'd like to pass back to Angie. Thank you so much, Dr. Bright. That was, uh, again, once uh, a really comprehensive overview of COVID-19 vaccines, their development, the trials, and all the great work that you and your team have been doing. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to you for coming in um, at relatively short notice and preparing such a detailed presentation. Um, there are lots of questions that have been fed through to us from previous webinars and also um, in terms of our outreach for preparing for this webinar, we've had uh, probably about another 50 questions that we would have loved to have been able to go through, but the time being as it is, um, we focused on the ones that seem to be the most commonly asked, but we will endeavor um, to answer as many of those and put them onto our website for people to read and, and digest at their leisure. Um, thank you, Dr. Bright, once again. Um, you've now uh, kindly lead us into the, the next presentation um, by Dr. Adnan Sharif. Um, Dr. Adnan Sharif, I've known for uh, about six years now. He's been uh, a real supporter of mine in the work that I've been doing around transplantation and organ donation in Islam. Um, as a renal patient myself, spent 23 and a half years on dialysis, received a living kidney donation 10 years ago. Um, talking to people like Adnan is, is, a, is a real asset. He is able to uh, give me peace of mind when I need to speak to somebody outside of my own consultant. And I trust him implicitly. And that's the reason why 
I've invited him along today to tell it as it is um, to me as a renal patient and to the many kidney patients who'll be watching this webinar today um, and their family members. So without further ado, if I may introduce Dr. Ertanan Sharif. Thank you very much, Amjad, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, as, as Amjad knows, I'm a, I'm a very simple plain speaker. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to really talk through how, uh, how COVID has kind of impacted on me from a, from a professional point of view and from a, from a personal point of view as well. Uh, I mean, normally at this time, I'd, I'd be at home kind of separating my young three young children from uh, having fights with each other. Uh, but as it turns out, I've just finished a shift in intensive care uh, and I'm still in my surgical scrubs. Um, so my my day-to-day -day activity has has completely changed um, as it has for kind of healthcare professionals everywhere. Um, I mean, from my perspective, um, COVID has impacted um, on me, obviously, from a personal point of view, but also professionally, um, how we work, but also for the patients that we look after. Um, kidney patients especially have been very vulnerable to coronavirus. And we were very worried at the beginning of the pandemic and as the months unfolded um, a lot of our worries um, were confirmed especially with the kind of disproportionate impact that coronavirus had on a number of our patients especially our dialysis patients um, and for our patients who've got very advanced kidney disease or who are on dialysis who have a kidney transplant for anyone who does catch coronavirus they had a one in five chance of dying and the thing about kidney patients, especially um, for a lot of specialities, you may have a health problem, you go see that specialist, the problem gets fixed, um, and then you may never see that specialist ever again. And our kidney patients um, are with us for life. Um, and you know, for people who do get advanced in kidney disease, who end up with some kind of therapy, whether it's dialysis or transplant, they remain under our care for many, many years. And you know, and I've got patients who um, I've known for over 10 years, you know, and they, they remember me from and when you know, I, was a, I was a baby registrar with kind of completely uh, dark hair and they know me now obviously with my gray hair and as we form a relationship with our patients we you know we, we want to make sure that we're always acting in their best interests um, and seeing how coronavirus has impacted on our patients especially here in Birmingham where we have a large um, population of uh, people from minority ethnic groups and you know that reflects in our kidney population as well especially because things like diabetes, high blood pressure is very common. So, um, you know, 40, 45% of our patients are from these communities. And vaccination, from my perspective, is, you know, is the way out of this, um, what I was about to say, out of this crisis, but out of this mess, really. Um, but it's understandable that people do have concerns. Um, and, you know, we're trying our very best to address those concerns. Um, and those are concerns that, you know, people will have, um, that, you know, we've heard from, from family members. Um, so I've got um, elderly parents myself uh, on, on my side. Um, it was a no-brainer. They were more than happy to have the vaccine. Um, but my parents-in-law um, needed a bit more convincing. Um, and, yeah, that's understandable. It's understandable that people do have concerns because there's so much misinformation out there and, and in fact there's just too much information and information changes um, and that's inevitable unfortunately because you know as the previous speakers have mentioned this is a completely new thing that's hit us and for a lot of us you know we are learning on the spot and as more information comes we always try to make sure that we're giving people the most up-to-date information um, and you know it is a concern when we hear reports that people from the BAME community are less likely to take the vaccine, especially as we know that the BAME community is more susceptible to the virus. Um, and certainly that's what we've seen here um, in Birmingham, in the hospital, a lot of the patients who are coming in disproportionately have been people um, from the BAME community. Um, and what I've noticed is that people who come in from the BAME community tend to be younger uh, and they also tend to have less other health issues as well. Um, so I think vaccination really is key. I was one of the first who rushed to get my vaccine. I had my first um, jab of my vaccination uh, just before Christmas, so uh, 21st of December. Um, and I was very fortunate and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my second vaccine. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that my parents and my parents-in-law, after a little bit of um, reassurance, um, have also now had the vaccine. And I think that's what we really need for a lot of people is just our reassurance. Um, because you know, it's, um, it's a new thing and people are concerned and people are worried. For a lot of our kidney patients though, um, for the vast majority, because they've seen the impact on the, 
on, on their friends, on their you know, other patients in the dialysis unit. And the vast majority of our kidney patients have really been rushing to get the vaccine. And one of the commonest things when we've been doing our telephone clinics, you know, something that we had to develop and um, to deal with the pandemic because we can't see patients, as many patients face to face, the commonest question people, people will often ask, especially transplant patients, is when can I have my vaccine? Um, and our dialysis patients, I'm pleased to say that I just had an email earlier today that uh, over 95% of my dialysis unit has been vaccinated and they've all been done in the last few days. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's great um, that you know, we are getting our patients vaccinated and we're just very keen that we try to understand what some of the concerns that people do have and try to work through those concerns because I think just with the right information um, and also under, you know, appreciating that you know, we know as much as we know and there are some unknowns um, and I think from my perspective when patients ask me and even when my parents ask me um, I told them you know, what I do know and um, also told them you know, the things that we, we simply do not know um, as already mentioned you know, kidney failure patients were not part of the original vaccination studies um, so we look at the information that we have we look at the impact that COVID has had. And from our perspective, you know, we make that judgment call that we think it's in the best interest for our patients. Um, and you know, we can talk through those and I'm sure we'll deal with some of these queries in the Q&A. So, uh, I mean, so from my perspective, you know, what is it I want? I want to try and protect as many of my patients as possible. And in fact, I want to protect all my patients. I want to make sure they all get vaccinated. And from a personal point of view, um, as much as I love being in intensive care and it's been great to be part of the team, I want to get back to my day job of looking after kidney patients. That's, that's why I came into this uh, profession. Um, and from a personal point of view, I want to um, start to return to some sense of normality, go on the holidays, see my parents, be able to kind of hug my parents. Uh, and above all, to stop having to homeschool my children, which has been one of the most testing things um, possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adnan. Um, as expected, um, you've hit the nail on the head um, in, in exactly what I was hoping for in terms of your presentation. Um, I'd just like to say that in, in terms of the group and I, uh, you know, I'd like to pay tribute to uh, Orin, Della, um, Primrose, uh, Dr. Ajimol, and others who've been involved in this process. And as we were discussing about the, the guest panelists, the conversation focused on very simply who is it that will um, come to the table and, and talk about it in a way that uh, presents the facts, the opinions and the fiction in a way that enables us to make the informed decision rather than being dictated to, we're actually being uh, understood, we're being encouraged to reflect, or we're being encouraged to seek out the right information um, rather than, you know, you've got it wrong, your perceptions are wrong. It is actually about valuing each person as an individual and tailoring the conversation to the way that that patient responds. So thank you, Dr. Adnan, for your presentation. I really appreciate it on behalf of myself and the team. Um, moving on to the next two presenters, who are going to now talk about the impact of COVID-19 on BAME uh, patients um, across the UK. Um, we've got Dr. Hudefa Adamali from North Bristol Trust, who is a respiratory consultant um, and we also have Dr. Valentine Ngwa, who is a, a general physician uh, working with COVID-19 patients. Um, both doctors are, are going to tell it as it is, and that's exactly what I've asked them to do. Um, I think as a patient, we need to understand um, the lived experiences of our colleagues in the NHS um, and the impact that it's having on them and how much we do need to listen to them going forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Valentine Engwa, please. Uh, th thank you very much, Amjit. Um, and thanks for inviting me uh, in this uh, very uh, uh, beautiful webinar. Uh, I'm going to try and lay the state out on the uh, vulnerability of the BAME community to COVID. As has been said, and as we know from the data, the uh, BAME community has a significantly in increased risk of having severe disease and dying with, with the COVID-19. And that was actually what came out from um, the document came out in the public in England in August of uh, last year. And we just got some data there was Charlene said about four times risk of dying from uh, the disease by Black Africans and Black Caribbeans. And you also see similar kind of ratio in uh, the South Asians as well. Now, I will spend the last, the next four and a half minutes 
if I may, just to try and give a reason why, or some reasons why this is happening, uh, why this vulnerability to the disease and to death is happening in this community. So just to say, therefore, that the three reasons why we'll make somebody have the disease or die from the disease. The first is the prevalence of the disease in your community. The second is the activities that you do that can bring you closer to the virus. And the third is your personal vulnerability. Now, we know that the Ben community have a higher chance of living in the multi-generational households. They have higher chance of living in a deprived community with overcrowding. They have higher chance of working in jobs that there are people facing like drivers and bus drivers and care workers, delivery men, which all means that there's an increased risk. We knew that from all the surveys that have been done before, the UK housing survey, the UK workforce survey, and the last census, the census of 2011, which means that there's already a population that has an increased risk of coming close to the virus. And now you can come close to the virus, but not actually have disease or severe disease or dying from it. It now depends on your personal vulnerability. And that's what I would want to dwell on the, on the next three minutes, if I may. Now, your vulnerability depends of course, your risk factor. We know that age is one of the biggest risk factors of having severe disease. And the data says that if you're 60, you have 30 times more chances of dying from the disease than somebody who is 20. I would like to break age down into chronological age and biological age because the fact that you're 60 doesn't mean anything. It depends on who, what kind of a 60 you are. So you could have two people who are 50 years old, for example, but one got diabetes, CKD, and hypertension. He is biological age more older than the other 50 year old who has got none of these comorbidities. But it gets quite difficult for us to quantify those, those, those uh, biological ages. However, with COVID, the beauty came about when there's an association called Alama that tried to put numbers to these words. Now, I must say with a caution, the Alama was trying to make sure that staff in the NHS are restratified from vulnerable, severe vulnerable, and not vulnerable. But what they did was they tried to put a bit of numbers. So if you are, if you are 50, for example, and you're getting, and you're from the uh, BEM community, from the Black African community, they're going to add seven years to your age, which means you are, have a higher chance of having severe disease if you have COVID than a wide counterpart of the same uh, comorbidity. Uh, and which therefore means, therefore, that, the, that us being able to assess that biological age, which they now call the COVID age, is far more important than the chronological age of these, our patients. So for example, if I take somebody who is 50 years old, who is from black Afro-Caribbean community, and he's got hypertension, he's got diabetes, he's got CKD, you're gonna add seven years for being black, you're gonna add seven years for being hypertensive, you're gonna add 16 years for having diabetes and 16 years for having CKD, which already puts him above an 85 year old person and that puts him in the highest risk category. So those kind of uh, uh, our patients are the ones who we should be looking at making sure that they're being protected because they are living in an environment where the virus prevalence is high. They are living in homes where they easily come across the virus. They are having jobs where they, uh, they also come across the virus and their personal vulnerability allows them to have severe illness from the virus or somebody of the same age without those comorbidities. And Dr. Sharif said one thing there, which uh, I really struck a chord. He said, he's finding quite a few of the uh, patients coming of younger age and with no comorbidities. And that also brings up another important aspect that we have to look into. And there are social, cultural, there are societal issues that are actually affecting our BIM community, which we are not dealing with. The one I would want to, apart from the vitamin D, which we know about, the one I would really want to stress upon is the effect of the uh, societal racism, uh, microaggression, and micro insult. A lot of studies have been done in the, in, in, in the world, particularly in, 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 uh, in America, to show that this, this uh, microaggression, racism, has an impact to predispose our people from having 
heart diseases, um, um, diabetes, and of course, other health conditions as well. So by and large, the Bain community, as we said, has been significantly impacted by the COVID-19. And we now know that there is a lot of reasons why this is so. And of course, the dialogue can carries on. But at this point in time, it is now saying we have to re-stratify our community and encourage them to take protective measures in all the other protective measures, but most importantly, receiving the vaccine because they sit on a very high pedestal when it comes to the vulnerability of having severe illnesses and dying from the disease. I'll let Dr. Sosifa now to the rest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Valentine. And uh, again, uh, a very comprehensive overview within the time limit as well. So fantastic. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, you, you've hit a real chord, actually, for me in terms of the conversation around disproportionality and the fact that COVID-19 has really highlighted health inequalities across the board. Um, and that neatly segues into the work that Dr. Azefa Adamali has been doing on a personal basis on top of his day job as a consultant uh, in ITU dealing with very, very sick patients, trying to encourage many members of the BAME communities to not only um, take the flu vaccine jab, but also then um, to really consider and make an informed decision around COVID-19. So uh, again, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ozefa Adamali. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to start off with a very controversial statement that I heard on a WhatsApp message. It said, and it made my heart sink, people don't leave the hospital if they get admitted with COVID-19. They don't care about us in hospital. They let you die. These statements almost made me cry. For the patient who's coming into the hospital with COVID-19, it must be really frightening to come in, into the hospital. But please let me reassure you that the majority of you will all recover from COVID-19 in your own homes. Less than 20% of patients would have to be admitted. I don't have to remind you, but the symptoms of COVID is the loss of taste, smell, sore throats, aches, pains, hot or cold sweats, and that fit, sense of fatigue. It's often the breathing difficulties that can be quite alarming. And that's when you will pick up the phone and call NHS 111, who will assess you and will either direct you to the emergency department or acute medical assessment unit. Now, one of the things that it's very frightening for the BAME community when they come into the hospital is the process. But let me reassure you, you will meet somebody of your skin color, of your religious background there because the NHS is a vibrant community of multicultural individuals. They will either speak your language and will re you will soon realize that you have a lot of commonness with all these individuals that are welcoming you into the hospital. You will be greeted by this incredibly motivated group of professionals, nurses, doctors, and allied professionals, and whose main mission is for you to recover and get you home. They will swab you, measure your temperature, blood pressure, oxygen levels, respiratory rate and pulse rate. And you will have a series of blood tests to check for infection, ensure your liver and kidneys are working fine. And if you need to, they will start you on oxygen therapy. When you come in, you'll probably have a temperature. So they'll give you some paracetamol. And they, if you're on oxygen therapy and you, they may start you on a drug called remdesivir or dexamethasone. Now, remdesivir is an antiviral medication, and that reduces the duration of the illness. And dexamethasone is a steroid that dampens the immune system and reduces the inflammation in the lungs. You will also be given blood thinners to prevent clots. And some of you may get antibiotics to fight bacterial infection. 
you will be approached by these wonderful research nurses who will encourage you to participate in clinical trials. Now, Phil Bright has already said that um, the vaccine trial has recruited quite a lot of BAME staff, but we find it difficult to recruit BAME patients into many clinical trials. But remember, your participation into these trials is crucial if we are to find cures to even fight this virus more quickly. So having you on these trials is going to be very important. Many of you will respond to the treatment, you'll get your, your oxygen will be weaned down and you will go home. For some of you, it might take longer to recover from COVID when you get home. And the main symptoms that people complain of is fatigue and that so-called long COVID symptoms that you can have. But it's important that you discuss that with your GP. However, despite all of these efforts, some of you will not be able to be weaned off the oxygen and you may need a mask that will be placed over your face called continuous positive airway pressure. The way I describe it to patients is having your head out of a window of a car and that gush of wind blowing air into your lungs. And it's to help you breathe. If you fail this continuous positive airway pressure, some of you will need to go on a ventilator. And that's when you will need to go into intensive care unit and that will require a general anesthetic. I just want to impress that I've seen so many people go home from this virus. They get better. And it's a great sense of achievement for all of us to get you home. But equally, sadly, many BAME people have passed away from this illness. We have treatments that help survival and it's important that we reduce deaths. So if you do develop COVID-19, it's important that you seek help and get into the hospital if you're advised by NHS 111. The efforts that are being put in place are immense and it's the incredible resilience of the NHS staff and teams that are making things work. We are enormously committed to your full recovery. We must grab the opportunity to prevent the transmission of the virus. So face, face and hands. And I would like to echo what my, all the wonderful people prior, prior to me and in future will say, you must grab this opportunity to have the COVID-19 vaccination to protect yourself, your communities and your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zefa. Uh, again, it's a, it's a privilege to know you and all of the speakers. Um, you've done yourselves proud and, and the team proud in the way that you've um, shared your thoughts and highlighted your concerns. Um, you know, I, there, there are no words to express my gratitude to you. Um, you've talked about accountability and it's about joint accountability in terms of the accountability of the NHS towards its patients, but us as patients having our accountability towards the NHS. Um, and I don't think you could have put it more eloquently. It leads us on now to Dr. Javid, who's going to close this session about the importance of taking the COVID-19 vaccination. We are a little bit behind uh, Dr. Javid, so if I could ask you to um, do your presentation within the time limit, that would be much appreciated. Over to you, Dr. Javid. Yeah, th thank you, Amjad. And uh, thank you to all the panelists who have spoken before me and excellent. And uh, thank you to Dr. Bright. Uh, I don't think I have to add much beyond what he has already uh, laid the stage for uh, vaccinations. Um, uh, just want to reassure the wider public because quite a few uh, myths circulating uh, on the WhatsApp, uh, how the vaccines have been fast forwarded and the, and the side effects and patients dying and all those kind of myths. Just to reassure you, like as I said earlier, this is not new. The, the, the work has been done for decades of research behind this. And uh, we had to respond, like Dr. Bright said, uh, rapidly on our feet. Uh, and uh, the, all the people on the, across the countries uh, came together to rolling out these massive trails 
and, and the UK licensed vaccines currently, the Pfizer, Moderna, and the Oxford, together if we combine, there are more than 100,000 volunteers in their phase three, and the side effects are almost next to nothing. And the ingredients which, he, which uh, Dr. Bright highlighted are, uh, are, are minimal, uh, uh, in particularly in the Pfizer and the Moderna, less than six ingredients. And uh, we, uh, we, we are really fortunate. I mean, if we actually take a, a pack of chips or uh, some nuggets from a frozen uh, thing, you would see at least 15 to 17 ingredients. And, 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 and it, it, it has been established many of those cause well, what problems it causes to the, to, to, the, to the wider community. But here, the vaccines, every each of the ingredient is considered to be safe. None of them has to be, has to be is animal derived. And particularly the, um, the, the mRNA has been, is a synthetically manufactured, uh, manufactured in the laboratory. So, uh, so, so from that point of view, it is safe. And one other thing uh, with respect to side effects, the, all the side effects which happen with the vaccines, I'm talking about uh, all, uh, the, even with the previous vaccines, happen within the first four to six weeks after receiving the vaccine. Uh, and uh, none of them says, okay, I had a mumps vaccine in 1980 and I'm now having a problem in 1990. It doesn't happen, it doesn't work that way. So a lot of people ask me, what are the long-term side effects of this COVID-19 vaccine? Why, whilst we cannot give the blank check, uh, we can reassure uh, the fact that now millions have got vaccinated. Uh, and we, we do not know of any kind of serious side effects apart from pain in the arm uh, and fatigue and uh, some kind of in, 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 in kind of a fever uh, within the first 48, 72 hours. Uh, and uh, these these side effects are uh, uh, go away. And sometimes when they are severe, we advise taking a, a bit of paracetamol here and there. Um, that, that's the thing. And, uh, and some other people are, are, are ask why Pfizer, why why are this manufacturing AstraZeneca people are they, have been involved? We have to take into account that we do not have the governments do not have the technological know-how to manufacture millions or billions of doses. We are talking about manufacturing more than 10 billion doses to vaccinate the entire world. So there has to be technological know-how. And the mRNA vaccine, particularly, and the you know, you know the Oxford, these are like blessing in disguise where we can manufacture in real time millions of these doses. Uh, and and we have witnessed to see how in UK itself now more than 10 million people have vaccinated successfully. So that, that's a major achievement uh, in, in, its, in its place. Uh, and no corners have been cut uh, with this vaccine, uh, with, with the trails. And uh, every trail has been independently verified by different, different bodies. Uh, and uh, and w let me reassure from an another point of view, if, even if people accuse that these uh, trails have been fake, now, three important trails, Pfizer, Moderna, and Ox Oxford AstraZeneca, th using the same similar concept of mRNA, done independently by in different, different uh, scientific people all across the world, came across the same conclusion. That doesn't happen if it is lies, if it is fake. I mean, uh, more than 90% efficacy for, for the same mRNA vaccine for, uh, for the Pfizer and Moderna, that, that speaks volumes. And the, 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 that truth can, uh, is reproducible. Falsehood is not reproducible. So th that's a, this is a, a, the whole thing summarizes the successful coming together of scientists and people, all the common people, public, uh, together in, in, in getting these vaccines rolled out. And um, uh, we had, uh, I, I say again, this is fortunate because the fastest vaccine prior to this ever rolled, rolled out to the public was mumps vaccine. And that took less than, a little bit less than five years. This is an amazing achievement. L low, lesser number of ingredients, no known kind of uh, harmful ingredients, no teratogenicity, no thiamarsan in it, no gelatin in it, um, and uh, uh, that, that proves itself that, that, that uh, these are safe vaccines. I'm happy uh, over to you, Amjad, um, and uh, I think we can take the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Dr. Javi. Thank you so much to, to all our panel experts for speaking. I'd just like to uh, take this opportunity to say a, a big thank you also to Dr. Rebecca uh, Suckling and Dr. Sapna Shah, who have been tirelessly answering the questions on the Q&A. We're up to 57 now, um, and all of those have been addressed within literally seconds of them being put up. So thank you to the team behind the scenes. Um, I'd just like to, uh, before we uh, lead into the Q&A session, um, you may well be asking, well, why have we done these presentations the way we have? And, and one of the key things that uh, I and uh, the panel that came together to put this um, seminar webinar together 
was that we wanted it to come across as a, as a conversation for people of all understanding. So whether you were coming in as a, a, a patient with chronic disease who has a great deal of, deal of knowledge, but also a patient who may well be right at the beginning of this process um, with limited understanding. And some patients have the confidence to ask technical questions of their clinicians, others don't. So I'm hoping that the way things have been presented today um, has been for uh, fit for all. Um, and I apologize if, if it's uh, uh, not hit all of the detail, but I'm hoping now that as part of the next um, session, uh, we've invited in some uh, community representatives and a specialist nurse. Um, the session is being chaired by my colleagues, Adela Adou and Primrose Granville, um, who will be uh, putting a select uh, set of questions to the panel um, to reinforce the message, um, but also perhaps to re-clarify some of the key concerns that we know exist within our BME community. So without further ado, if I may hand over to Della and Primrose. Hi, Angie, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Della Idol, and I'm the founder of Gift of Living Donation. And I really wanted to take part in this sub seminar today because of the number of black renal peer patients who had died from, from COVID. It wasn't a small number and it really was a cause for concern. And I remember saying to Abdul, we need to do something about that. So that's really why I'm here today. And I hope people go away better informed so that they can protect themselves and, and, and their families. And we've heard a lot from panelists today as well, but I think it's also important that we do hear from patients and to find out from their perspective what their concerns are. And hopefully today through some of their questions, you'll be able to have some of your questions answered. So I'm gonna to speak to Bertram, Bertram Jones, who is our first um, guest patient today. And, and Bertram, just to say that apart from the fact that the obvious fact that me and you are black, me and you have another connection and that is that we both came forward as living kidney donors for our loved ones. So I know that as a living kidney donor, there might be living kidney donors on this particular call, or there might be somebody who is thinking of being a living donor. So do you have any questions as a living donor that you would like to put across to our panel um, this evening? Thank you very much, Dele. Yes, I do. And, and thank you so much to the panel. Uh, you know, the presentation so far has been very, very helpful. As a kidney donor, I will um, I'll ask, having the vaccine, uh, would that place any additional pressure on my remaining kidney? I'm going to, I'm going to, I know we've got a doctor in the house, so I'm going to, Adnan, I don't know whether you can ask, answer that question, being that you are a kidney specialist doctor. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, the information that we have is that being a kidney donor in, in no way impacts um, on you getting a vaccine, on the, on the efficacy of the vaccine, or any short-term, long-term risks of, of having the vaccine. Um, so, I mean, from our perspective, um, we're not remotely concerned um, for, for kidney donors or people who are thinking about donating the kidney from, from having the vaccine. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Bertram? Thank you very much, that Dr. Sure. Yes, it does. Yeah. I'm now going to hand it over to my co-facilitator, and that is Primrose. Thank you, Della. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Primrose Granville, and I am first and foremost a transplant patient. It means that I will be one of those patients with my renal department for the rest of my life. I'm also a a journalist. I'm also a member of my community. I sit on uh, a couple of boards where I represent members of the African heritage community mainly, uh, but lots of other members from the BAME communities in Bristol. And I believe that my community really needs to take up the vaccine. I've had a new lease on life by having my transplant, and I would not like to jeopardize that in any way. And I do think that we really need to think of what it is that this vaccine is offering rather than the misinformation that we are getting 
outside. And I really think that a forum like this has really, really answered some of the difficult questions. And I hope that people will take away from it the information that they need to go and think and make the right decision. So I am speaking to Yvonne Matillo, who I know has some questions. Yvonne, you've got some concerns about the vaccines, haven't you? Um, yes, um, I think one of the, it's been touched on a couple of times by Dr. Ahmed and again by Dr. Um, Bright about the mRNA. So thank you very much to those doctors for um, going into some detail. Um, but because from things that are, you know, the information that's out there is suggesting that this is, this is very new. And my understanding is that it's um, genetic material, it's synthetic, synthetically manufactured, um, and essentially a set of instructions to stimulate the immune system. But my question is, um, why is it particularly needed for fighting COVID? What is so different um, with COVID? Um, and it, you know, it appears that there's two vaccines that have this mRNA, but AstraZeneca doesn't. So why is it why is it particularly needed? And I believe that question will be answered by Dr. Bright. Uh, yeah, very happy to respond to that. So, so it's not that it's needed; it's that the technology that create that's been created to to make these vaccines has only just been created. So it's not that COVID is special in some way; it's that the technology to do this has only recently been created. Um, it, it, it was just another method of, uh, of putting the spike protein, which is the, the, the bit that we want an immune response to, into the body in a way that provokes an immune response. And having different ways of doing this in, uh, is likely to be useful because using the same vaccine over and over again may not be as effective as doing different vaccines. Um, has that answered your question? Um, yeah, but so... Um... So with the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's still just as effective, even though it doesn't have this just genetic material in it. Is, is that well, the case? Um, so, so, so the effectiveness of them, it's hard to compare the effectiveness directly because the way the studies are set up is slightly different. So, so how they class it, how, the people that they recruit, uh, that how they define disease, how they, how, how they define the, the endpoints. Doing direct comparisons is difficult, but, but the, the headline figures of how well they work is it has a higher figure for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine than it does for the AstraZeneca. In terms of the, the mRNA, well, RNA is put in to the AstraZeneca vaccine because it's added inside the cold virus, but the way it's packaged is different. So there is viral RNA in the AstraZeneca vaccine, but it's packaged differently and it's not just an mRNA vaccine. It's, it's put inside a virus rather than inside a little globule package of, of lipid. Or fat. Right, and that virus isn't live. Uh, the the so technically the Oxford vaccine is live, but everyone can have it. So that's something I did want to clarify, um, because it cannot replicate. So 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 it, you're generally told if you've had a transplant, you can't have a live vaccine. You can have this one. It's technically a live vaccine, depending on how you define live in in a virus. Um, the, the mRNA uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are non-live. There was nothing live in them. They're just a little bit of mRNA in a package. What that does is it uses you to create a protein, and then that protein is the bit that, you, that your immune system responds to. But, it, but the mRNA from that has gone very, very quickly. Probably within an hour or two, it's gone completely because it's a very fragile thing. So as a, as a, so if somebody has had a, a transplant, an organ transplant, they can have whichever vaccine they yeah. can have. In. Um, and Dr. Sherry Franklin will back me up on that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, this has been um, discussed and agreed with, um, you know, colleagues nationally, internationally. Um, we are happy for our transplant patients, any transplant, uh, any kind of organ. The priority is, get the first vaccine that you are offered. You know, if you want the best protection, just get the first vaccine that you are offered. And I have, my transplant patients have had um, one vaccine versus the other, makes no difference to me. I just want to get them vaccinated. It's as simple as that. Right, okay. Right. And just, and just sorry, just one last thing is, is so it, 
the um, and this is something that a lot have concerns with that the mRNA does not in any way alter um, the host DNA. Um, I can say categorically the answer to that is no, it does not. So there is no mechanism for it to do so. Um, it does not get involved with the DNA. It's not in proximity to it. Um, it does not alter host DNA at all. It does not alter the way we are, apart from by provoking this immune response that we want. Okay. Thank you for those excellent answers, uh, Dr. Sharif and Dr. Bright. And thank you for your questions, um, Ivan. And we hope they've been answered sufficiently. Thank you. Thank you so much. And my last question is to Cardin. Cardin Carr is an advanced kidney nurse specialist at Angai's Hospital. So Carly, you're used to seeing patients every day on, on a daily basis. And I'm very sure a lot of them would have come to you about their concerns about the, the vaccine. Um, what question would you really like to put to the panel that represents the question that you see or the key concerns you see for most of your black patients? Thank you, Della, for the question. Um, and thank you also for inviting me along. Um, Kidney Care UK is very, very interesting uh, webinar. This is, and I'm so pleased to be here. I've actually worked, just a little bit of background, I've worked in renal as a renal nurse for a good part of about 30 years in very different aspects of it. Um, and I've seen a lot of black patients, especially in the dialysis unit. And um, I'm currently working in an area where we prepare patients for dialysis and transplantation. And some of the concerns these patients may have um, about the COVID vaccine, um, and obviously I couldn't answer them and hopefully we answer it today. But the other concern they have is while we prepare these patients for their dialysis or to have a transplant, there are other essential vaccines that they need to have um, for them to be safe in terms of the hepatitis B virus as well as the varicella virus. Now, while we are concentrating at the moment the COVID vaccine, the patients are concerned that, you know, when am I going to have my next um, hepatitis B vaccine? Um, bearing in mind these vaccines um, are more than one, some, um, especially for hepatitis B, it seems three and sometimes four vaccines that these patients need to have to complete the course. Um, the varicella zoster is two vaccines for those who are varicella negative. Um, my question is, how do we prioritize um, completing these vaccinations with these patients in the midst of actually integrating the COVID vaccine and concerns about interactions as well with the vaccine? Um, the, co um, the hepatitis C vaccine and the COVID vaccine. And it sounds a little bit jumbled, but I just hope you can actually um, disseminate uh, what I'm actually trying to say. Patients are concerned that they're not completing their vaccination program and they would like to know um, what interactions will the COVID vaccine have with um, their other essential vaccines. Is that okay? That's fine, Carly. Um, I don't know who which of our panelists has been nominated to answer that question. I think if we could begin with Dr. Adnan and perhaps Dr. Adnan, you could sign first just to one of our other clinical colleagues. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, f f from my perspective, um, yeah, I mean, our patients uh, do need other vaccinations. And I mean, our certainly our dialysis patients who get their hepatitis B vaccinations, you know, that has been uninterrupted. Um, and while we were approaching winter and we knew that the coronavirus vaccines were hopefully going to become a reality, um, we've had a program here in Birmingham where we vaccinate um, our dialysis patients with the flu vaccine rather than, you know, for a lot of our hemodialysis patients, you know, you're on a dialysis machine three times a week. I think using one of your free days to go to uh, your GP to get uh, your flu vaccine is, is difficult. So we've been um, doing a flu vaccine for our patients and we did that in a timely fashion. And I think that's probably the key thing is just good organization. We did the flu vaccinations in a timely manner and encouraged all of our transplant patients to get the flu vaccine in a timely manner so that when the coronavirus vaccine was hopefully approved, that they would be able to get that um, as soon as possible. So I think we need to ensure that our patients do get all their vaccinations um, and we just need to be better organized. And as you know, things unfold and as it looks like, we'll need a top-up 
of, of these vaccines. We'll just need to make sure that you know, we know what vaccinations our patients need and we organize that in a timely fashion um, because we need to make sure our patients are vaccinated for everything that's essential for their care. Thank you so much. Carlin, uh, that's good information for your patients um, when you go back and see them. And, and I hope that's been able to answer your question. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up this section of, of the question and answer. As a black person, I definitely understand the hesitancy in my community, but I'm gonna end with a quote from the famous black American um, novelist, James Baldwin. And he said that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. And I was, as black people, we have every reason to be hesitant, but we don't wanna be trapped in our history in the sense that when our lives are, are not saved, I will not protect our loved ones, I will not protect myself. So I do understand about our history and our history has got it, its right place. But I think on this occasion, when it's talking about the virus and protecting ourselves, maybe we just have to put our history to one side on this occasion. So I just wanna end this session of the question and answer and I hope that people will go away informed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Della and Primrose. Della, that was a, a really poignant end to that session of the webinar. And thank you so much again to you and to Primrose for all of the support that you've given me and the team um, to get this webinar up and running. It wouldn't have happened without you guys. So thank you so much again. Um, it now leads on to the next uh, and last session. I apologize on behalf of myself and the team, we are running behind, it is 6.30. Mm -hmm. It is now the last session, which is another 15 minutes. And this is a, a key session for us to conclude. Um, faith, we know, plays an important role in the lives of diverse communities, particularly within the South Asian community and the Black African Caribbean community and others. And, and we've reached out as best we can to find and identify um, key speakers, key faith leaders, um, who are able to come on board and, and talk about their personal lived experiences of having to deal um, with and support communities since the advent of COVID-19. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Oren Lewis, who's going to kindly introduce our speakers who are with us this evening. Um, and I think this will help us all, including me. I had my vaccine at the weekend, but just to reinforce in my mind, that what I've done was the right thing at the right time. So over to you, Oren. Thank you so much, uh, Amjit. And uh, yes, it's this webinar is very thought provoking and looking at the questions and answers uh, section, it is really uh, getting into the underbelly of the, of the hesitancy that's out there and a lot of great questions and lots of great answers and presentations are, are really going well. Faith, as you know, is very key to our communities in terms of making it a holistic, physical, spiritual, mental connection. And I want to in introduce uh, some key people from, from the faith who can give a view about how their faith looks and, uh, at this from their community and from their religious sector. So I'd like to introduce, firstly, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, in Watford, Pastor Ian Sweeney. Thank you very much, Aaron. As a Christian, I recognize that um, my personal views and the views of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which I lead in the British Isles, do not represent those of all the 33 million Christians that are in the UK. This being said, our faith community, along with many other Christians, place strong emphasis on health and well-being. And as proponents of leading a healthy lifestyle and seeing preventative health as our first medicinal resource, we, our community, encourages responsible immunization and vaccination, and we have no religious or faith-based reason not to encourage our community to responsibly participate in protective and preventative immunization and vaccination programs. We value the health and safety of the population, which includes the maintenance of, our, of, our, of herd immunity. Now, my faith and my belief in an all-powerful God 
is not in conflict with taking a vaccine. Indeed, all of my actions and all of our church actions are an integral part of our faith. You know, Jesus was recorded as saying, the greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them. And in the context of this pandemic, pandemic, Christians, I believe, can demonstrate their love, their care, their concern for others by giving their lives, but not in death, I hasten to add. You know, I've not been able to see my elderly mother for over a year now, but I saw her today and I on, 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 um, on, on uh, Amazon Echo show. But, and, and the reason I've ha I haven't seen her is because I've given up a part of my life that she would be protected from this horrid virus. You know, at the outset of this pandemic, our church leaders took the decision to close our places of worship before the national lockdown was announced by the PM. Now, this was met with intense criticism and comment that we as leaders, we lacked faith in God. But this decision was taken because the protection of the most vulnerable in our community was paramount. We knew that our elder members and our elder community love to be in their churches. and But we knew that by keeping our churches open, Open and having people in close proximity to one another, the outcome was going to be devastating. And so we believed closing our places of worship was a responsible action motivated by our faith and beliefs. And so as a leader of, and, and in part of the Christian community, neither I or the church, and this is a thing that I've been hearing, we do not seek to play, take the place of an in, individual's conscience. We recognize that individual choices must be respected. However, in my personal opinion, taking preventative and protective measures such as wearing a mask, observing lockdown, taking the vaccine is part of my responsibility to protect others. And so I would appeal to members of the Bain community to seek information from reliable sources where there's evidence of research, peer reviews and the like. Don't just rely on, on, on WhatsApp and social media messages. And, and, you know, because I find it terribly sad. And, and my colleagues who are uh, uh, performing funerals too frequently, I find it terribly sad that COVID-19 has taken a greater toll on, on our community than others. And I find it terribly sad that our community is leading in vaccine hesitancy, even though I understand the, why it's the case. So I, I, I close my remarks with the words of a man who was inspired by the words of Jesus, and his name was Paul. And he wrote, look out for the Look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. And I believe that our actions today as a community can be a contemporary demonstration of our care for one another. And I believe that this is part of our obligation to God for the life he has given us. And, and we are able then to live a life in effective service for others. And so I'd just like to say that in these in these times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Sweeney. That is a powerful statement of intent. And I, I made some notes here where you mentioned responsible action. It is down to individual choices, to and but it's also about protecting others. And the point you made about our lives are, is, are an integral, integral part of our faith. That's powerful. Um, thank you so much for that. I'd like to ne next bring to the microphone uh, from the Islamic scholar and Muslim chaplain in Bradford, um, Mufti Muhammad Zubir Butt. I'm did I could save you a lot of time here by just saying ditto to what Pastor Ian Sweeney just said. <laughs> uh, but since I've waited for one and a half hour, I'd like my two minutes as well. Um, well I, from my perspective, I will very much echo what Pastor Sweeney has said, and that particularly would be the Islamic perspective as well. However, I would just add that uh, we pride us, as Muslims, we pride ourselves on being a tradition of verification. And the Quran tells us that when somebody comes to us with some news of something, فتبين, then verify that, lest you end up harming others out of ignorance. Okay? And 
if I can quote a statement of Prophet Speedy upon him, that it's sufficient for a person to be untruthful, that they just forward and repeat whatever they hear. And that's what you get across in social media. Uh, another example I can give you is in the science of hadith where we are the statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have a whole science on verifying which of his statements are actually were actually said by him or not. And there's a whole science behind that. Uh, similarly, in Islamic law, when we choose between competing opinions, there is a methodology of, of, of taking the most correct opinion. So as a tradition, we are all about verification. And so therefore, I would just echo the fact that um, when you see something on social media, don't just take it at face value. Often when you dig below the headlines, you'll find it is very shallow uh, and you'll find that it's is either untruth or half truth or misconstrued truth. Now, you know um, that for the last 24 years, I've been flirting with organ donation, on organ transplantation and the Islamic position on that. Um, and for since 2002, uh, I've, start, I, I've been teaching about the Islamic position on organ transplantation uh, at Leeds uh, Beckett University and then after that at different places and part of chaplaincy courses for upcoming uh, Muslim chaplains. However, for 20 years, 20, uh, 22 of them years, I never gave an opinion and I'm trained and given, trained and given legal opinion. I'd never gave an opinion on this issue. And it was only after being cajoled by Amjid Ali in 2019, uh, I hibernated for five months in what was supposed to be a project for two weeks, was it I'm just three weeks, and I hibernated for five months, and then came out with a ruling of ninety pages, uh, which I'd, I'd never done I'd never ruling ever in my life, uh, and because I, I had to satisfy myself of all the um, questions that were in my mind with regards to what Islam would say about this particular issue. Now, when it comes to supporting uh, vaccine. Uh, uh, vaccine and uh, encouraging people uh, to come forward and take the vaccine, the same procedure applies there as well. I, right, Amjid will know that right from the beginning, even before the pandemic hit our shores, and whilst we were observing what is happening in the Far East, and then slowly it came to Europe and Spain and Italy, etc., uh, I spent even before the lockdown two months reading everything I could get from the World Health Organization, from the Center of Disease Control in America, uh, from the European Center of Disease Control and Prevention in, in, uh, in Europe, and NHS England and Public Health England and the Health and Safety Executive, everything I could get. Why? Because I knew tomorrow I would be asked a question about these issues. What does Islam say with regards to this? And I can remember on the 3rd of March, I, I lead a... Um, a group of Muslim chaplains in the north, which covers Leeds, Bradford, Wakefield, Huddersfield, Sheffield, up to Blackpool. And I asked a question with regards to uh, donning the PPE and those of our colleagues, especially Muslim colleagues that had were supporting beards and would be required to shave their beards, what would happen? Would they be allowed to do that? And uh, very soon I started getting them questions. Um, when I asked my colleagues, it came, I came back with silence and then I knew, okay, I'm going to have to do this one as well. So right from the beginning, we have been on board. I can remember Dr. Munir Ahmed from uh, Loughborough University, who's also uh, you know, a virologist and working on vaccines, etc. Right at the beginning, we were involved in discussion with them. And so all throughout the year, we have been involved, with Muslim scholars, myself, have been involved with health professionals. And so when we, when we ask the community and advise the community to take up the vaccine, we are doing in full confidence and with uh, a proper procedure as well, just as I did in my organ transplantation and um, uh, fatwa, a legal opinion. Here also we adopt the same procedure because we are we take our responsibility very seriously. And what we consider is that when we declare something to be permissible, lawful or unlawful, we are actually signing on behalf of God. We are actually signing on behalf of God, which is a huge responsibility. And so therefore, with all confidence, I can say that with all the knowledge that is available to us, there is no issue with you taking up the vaccine. There is no, there's nothing in our faith as well that prevents you from taking the vaccine. In fact, I could even argue that our faith would encourage you to take the vaccine so that 
you, you, we can ensure that our lives get uh, get back to you know back to normal as soon as possible, and we protect as many people as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that riveting endorsement uh, from an Islamic uh, point of view. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I picked out again one or two key words and phrases right from the start. You said verification is so important. Uh, digging below the headlines to get to the truth and taking um, a um, taking responsibility very seriously. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, quickly moving on to uh, representing Bhakshri Swami Narayan Mande, Dr. Markan Patel. Thank you and good evening. On behalf of BAPS Swaminarayan Sanstar and Eastern Temple, I'd like to thank Kidney Care UK for hosting this webinar and inviting our participation. There is no doubt we are currently facing an extremely challenging health crisis, which has been difficult for everyone. As we have heard in detail from the previous speakers, BAME communities have been disproportionately impacted, and I'm sure we all know someone who has sadly lost their life to COVID-19. Nevertheless, vaccination is providing us with the light of hope in the fight against COVID-19. At the BAPS Sri Swaminan Mandir or Neeson Temple, all have been working tirelessly to provide the Hindu community, not only in London, but across the UK with accurate and timely information about COVID-19 and vaccination. I'd just like to sh share some of our experiences of this. So we understand that although the majority of Hindus are happy to receive the vaccine, a small minority may be reluctant to take it. To help educate Hindus and South Asians about the facts we've produced a number of public health awareness videos about COVID-19 and vaccination in both English and Gujarati. A number of people in the community have been the target of misinformation and scaremongering about the vaccines. One of the videos helps counter misinformation and debunks some common myths while sharing the facts about testing, approval and licensing of the vaccines in the UK, assuring their safety and efficacy. In our most recent video, senior Hindu religious leaders a medical professional and devotees who have received the vaccine share their insights and personal experiences to encourage the community to take the vaccine. One of the senior Swamis of BAPS says in this video that taking the vaccine when invited is our responsibility, a moral duty and a great service to our country. We have also produced videos about looking after our own, our own mental and physical health during the pandemic all of which we've uploaded for anyone to view on the BAPS Charities YouTube channel. In addition, every evening, the head monk at the Neeson Temple, Sadhu Yog Vivek Das, who was formerly a medical doctor from Leicester, delivers a daily webcast message with important governmental updates and announcements, reminders of the precautions we should take, information about testing, isolation, and important information about vaccination in a mix of the Gujarati and English languages. He emphasizes that vaccination is permissible according to Hinduism and that the vaccines do not contain any animal products or egg. He has also endorsed enrollment of Hindus into the University of Oxford led COVID-19 principal trial, arranged a COVID testing site at the Neeson Temple, which has been running successfully for many months and encouraged a number of Hindu community members to volunteer at local COVID-19 vaccination clinics. Annual flu vaccination promotion has also continued through the videos and announcements. And research has shown that those who have the flu vaccine are also more likely to have co the COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, just last week, a new COVID vaccination center was opened at the Neeson Temple in London, providing vaccinations not only for Hindus, but also the wider local community. Together with our other ongoing measures, vaccination will form a part of our surest efforts to help fight this global crisis and will help protect our communities and our loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark and Patel. I really appreciate that. And the key points I picked up on that was the moral duty of the community um, in terms of coming forward, the uh, accurate timely information that you're putting out there in, in, in different languages, in, in, especially in the videos is very important and the endorsement of the trials and the, and the clinics uh, and opening up the centers, like you said, in, in Kilburn, 
um, to not only the, the, the Hindu community um, and of faith, but to the wider community, making it all inclusive. It's, it's so refreshing to hear. Uh, finally, um, bring in a bit of uh, fire and brimstone uh, to the uh, vaccine hesitancy faith leaders perspective is the vicar from Holy Trinity Church in Birmingham, Reverend Eve Pitts. Good evening, good evening. Yes, I don't know about fire and brimstone. Uh, yes, well, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I am right in the middle of what is termed the inner city. A wonderful place to be, despite its problems, despite the economic problems and educational um, problems that we have. It's a vibrant spiritual place. One of the great things about being a Caribbean and African woman is really that we are a deeply spiritual people. And that's not dependent on whether we go to church or not. In fact, if you, most of the spiritual people I meet don't go to church, they don't darken the church door. But they are deeply spiritual nonetheless. Now, during this pandemic, it, it's been a very difficult time for me personally. I've lost good friends. I have lost members of my family. I've taken an awful lot of funerals, not all of them through the, the virus, but you know, people who are ill. And, and so I've had a lot of funerals, a lot of time to think about what it means to serve this great community, this spiritual people we call Caribbean people. Now, when I started this at first, I thought, shall I remain silent? Shall I just simply sit back and watch and decide whether or not I would speak at some point? I have a responsibility as the priest of this place, not only for the people who come through my doors on a Sunday morning, but those who are at Bing, up at the shops, at the barber shops. I hang out in those places quite deliberately. And, and I go to the pubs when we had pubs. We've lost the pubs, but I frequent those places and I'm not afraid to go to the uh, barber shops and sit down and have my hair done and have some kind of political uh, or indeed spiritual conversation with those who come through the doors. So it's been a, a wonderful opportunity for me as a priest within this place to acknowledge that my congregation were beginning to be fearful, fearful about what this meant for them. And so I had to really think through this, not only from a personal point of view, but also from um, uh, uh, spiritual and wider uh, responsibility in the community. The first thing I had to decide was, what's my position on this? Am I going to take the vaccine? I've got two granddaughters and three children, and of course a husband, and lots of good people I love. I had to face my own doubts and fears and anxiety. Fundamentally at the heart of the community is a deep-seated fear and suspicion about the society in which we have been brought up in, many of us shaped by it, my generation grown up in it. But I was very aware that there's a deep distrust for good reason. And as has been said before, our history is littered with some really painful memories that many of us would rather walk away from, and quite understandably. That said, my job was to say, yes, I understand that. I really, I get that. And I know it's been hard. We had no good reason to trust, not politicians, and sometimes people who have looked the other way. Once I was able to ascertain where people were in my congregation or in the local pub, or in fact, in the local barbershop, I was able to say, I have made this decision for myself. One of the great passages I love from the scripture is, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it in all its abundance. And it has to be said that there were times when it was difficult to see that abundance educationally, spiritually, physically, or otherwise. And when you are tainted by a history which haunts you, I as a priest had to be really sensitive about this. This takes sensitivity, clarity, love, and patience to understand where the people you serve, the people I serve, where they are and how they've arrived there. Most of the people I encounter in the streets, on the buses, I deliberately don't drive cars. I wish sometimes I didn't make that decision, but that's my decision. I go on the buses. I've seen the palp of the fear. I've seen and encounter those who want to make sense of their faith in a time of suffering, to talk about suffering 
and faith has been really ex difficult for me and for them. How do we explain suffering in a world where God loves us and we're told that God loves us? I had to talk about that theologically and to make sense in my head. Cannot be explained away, but to enable the congregation to accept and to come to terms that this is the reality and I want them to live. So I didn't force my congregation or indeed anyone I met on the bus or in the bookies or up at the Bing's shop to take this vaccine. I placed before them the reality that I understand why they were fearful, why they were suspicious, because more often than not, the information was not given direct to us. No one tried hard enough to communicate in a way which would enable African Caribbean people in this neighborhood, largely um, elderly, largely suffering from some of the health conditions, and largely probably not as educated as those who were given the information. I, as a priest, had to make a decision to say, this life that God gives us, he wants us to have it in abundance. So therefore I have a responsibility to say that despite your doubts, despite the fears and the mistrust, and those who do not live within our community boundaries, and those who were giving misinformation, those who did not have the well-being of this great community that I have and that I'm a part of and privileged to be a part of at heart, I had to say to them, I cannot direct you. But what I can do is to tell you that for the sake of my own family, I want to live long enough to see them grow old, I want to see myself live to be 100. I want to be able to sing when I'm 98 and spit when I'm 98 and do all the kinds of outrageous things that I want to do when I'm old. I want to live to see that. I want to live to see my granddaughters go to university and everybody else's grandchild. My spiritual responsibility is to say, I know why you feel this way. I get it. If you think I don't struggle with doubt, you are very much mistaken. I struggle with faith doubt as a spiritual person. I have political questions that are unanswered, educational issues that are absent in my community. But at the end of the day, my spiritual responsibility is to say to you, I love you. Whether you're in the barber shop saying, I don't believe in all that nonsense, or whether you're down at the pub saying, no, no, we're going to be safe forever and ever. Can I ask you to think again? I would not direct anyone because that's your emotional, spiritual, political, and historical decision. I'm not denying anything I've said or anyone else has said about our history, littered with nonsense and pain. But I implore you that this life that God has given in all its abundance, that God wants us to live and to enjoy in all its fullness, please make that decision. Make it with clarity. Take it from people who know what they're talking about, people who love you deeply. So when I meet you on the bus and say, have you thought about this? Or whether it's outside the pub down the road, or whether it's outside trying to find the guys at the bookie, I'm asking you, and those who are well-read, and those who say, we know what we need to do. Get on, do it. For the sake of our elders, for the sake of those who for complex medical, educational, and social reasons do not have the information. I hope that tonight, which has been a fabulous evening, that we will take this God at his or her word. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it in all its abundance. It's for us, with all the difficulties that that entails, to accept. May I, as a priest, who has feet of clay, say this is what I have to offer this great community from which I have sprung. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Byron Brimstone, you brought it to the table and uh, you're a hard act to follow, but it's, it's our, four, our four speakers of faith have delivered um, their own individual testimony as to why we need to do our own research and to also question um, the facts to get to the truth and get away from the fiction that's, that's out there. And as you said, uh, Reverend Pitts, you know, too many funerals you've been to and, uh, you know, you want to, what does it mean to serve the community? 
you know, we all have the time to look back and think what we need to do. And if, uh, if faith is important to us, we need to look at what the text in, 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 in our religious texts say and to uh, question what is, my, what is my position. So really thank you very much for the four speakers there. I think you really sort of clothed this, this, this presentation tonight um, in all aspects of looking for the, for the truth and positioning it with, with the faith so that faith and technology can work side by side to allow us all to make informed decisions. On that note, I'd like to hand back to, to Amjid to close this in really informative session that we've had tonight. Thank you, Warren, and thank you to all, all the speakers once again. Uh, Julie, if I may ask if you could put up the last slide. Um, I'd like to begin by offering a sincere apologies for running over, but I'm sure you will all agree that the, the last 30 minutes uh, have been absolutely worth it um, to hear from our colleagues from both the um, community in terms of the additional questions and, and from our faith leaders to give us that additional perspective in terms of helping us making an informed decision. So to clear, close, I'd like to begin by saying a big thank you to all our presenters, um, our clinical colleagues who've given up their time um, at, 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 I have to say some short notice to be with us here today um, to give that clarity um, and also our clinical colleagues behind the scenes who have been answering as I can see on, on the, the screen in front of me we've had over 91 questions that have been answered this evening so thank you to all of those individuals. I'd also like to thank our guest patients and specialist nurse who put the questions to our panel um, I'd like to extend a, a, a very big thank you to our faith leaders. Um, I spoke to each one of our speakers individually over the last two weeks. And uh, I have to say, you know, I had concerns at the beginning whether this seminar will all fit together. But I think from my personal perspective as a patient, as a member of the, the BME community, I wanted to ensure that we were taking you through a narrative from beginning to end and to demonstrate that we understand um, the cultural differences that exist within our communities, that we all have differing viewpoints uh, and uh, that it's our duty and responsibility to acknowledge that. It's, it's wrong to assume that we know what is right and, and just to preach the facts without taking into consideration how people feel and what are the influencing factors on us when we're making decisions. So I'm hoping that what you've heard tonight will lead you to that position um, to be able to move forward and to have that conversation with your family so that collectively you're doing the right thing that's right for you. Um, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. We've had some great feedback on the comments so far. So Thank you for that, but your additional feedback will be most welcome. Um, the talk will be available as a recording plus a report on the Kidney Care UK website um, shortly. So as soon as we've wrapped up today, my colleagues uh, at Kidney Care will be working behind the scenes to get that ready. Um, on behalf of Kidney Care UK, African Caribbean Leukemia Trust, Gold and our presenters, thank you for joining us today. And we wish you a very safe um, evening and thank you again and take care. Mm -hmm.